please remain standing for the reading of the word. Then I'm going to ask, just like I did last week, that you join me and we're going to read the 23rd Psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me like a hound in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You will anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So as I said earlier, we started Psalm 23 last week. We're going to finish looking at it today. And we find ourselves kind of at a transition point in this particular psalm, beginning with verse 4. Because up until this point, it seems as though the psalmist has actually been <clears throat> willingly speaking to anybody he can find about who his good shepherd is. And now as we begin with, with verse 4, we see some pronouns creeping in, I's and you's. And this psalm now it turns into this almost intimate, personal conversation between the sheep and his shepherd. Because now the sheep is acknowledging everything the shepherd has done for him. So many scholars, when they look at this psalm, look at the entirety of the psalm as being the yearly cycle of, of the sheep and the shepherd and from their, their time in, in the winter all the way through to winter again. And so if we were to just take a, a brief glance at this psalm that way, verse 4 kind of finds us in that place where, where the sheep now and the shepherd are on the move. We're moving from spring towards summer. The green grass down low is starting to dry up. Sources of water are, are getting harder to find. And so now they're on the move. And, and typically being on the move means that you have to move to a higher elevation. And so the shepherd starts to move them. And sheep move slow. They eat as they go, they drink as they go, there would be lambs, and so they can only go really as fast as the lambs allow. So they're headed up, looking for more green grass, looking for more water. In some parts of the world, that means going up way high in the mountains. We saw that when we were in Norway a few years ago, that most of them take their flocks and their herds way up into the mountains and they, and they have little huts that they live in with grass roofs and it's, it's beautiful up there. For others, that means maybe going up into the hills. But the thing is, for most shepherds who are moving their sheep, it involves going through some valleys, some, some, some ditches, if you will, because those are the places still where they could find water as they traveled. Sometimes, however, in Judea where, where David lived, as they would enter into these, these valleys, um, they would find very little water. They called these, these places wadis. You and I would call them a wash. Flash floods were, flash floods were a danger, and so they had to be alert, they had to be aware. But the thing about shepherds is this. Shepherds would leave their sheep in the care of another shepherd, and they would go and scout out the places that they wanted to go, the places where they wanted to take their sheep to make sure there would be sufficient water, to make sure that there would be enough green vegetation for the sheep to eat. And they would look for places of danger hidden ravines and, and poisonous plants and weeds and places where predators could hide because the shepherd never took their sheep 
someplace where they hadn't already been. They didn't want to be taken by surprise by anything. If we go back even farther into Scripture, like the book of Deuteronomy, we'll see that God has been promising to go ahead of His people, ahead of His sheep, from very early on. This from Deuteronomy 31. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. And we know from the book of Exodus that God promised to go ahead of His people, Israel, as they wandered in the wilderness, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And in Psalm 139, another Psalm of David, we read this. David writes, You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon my head. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. We know that. He told us that. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. But the thing is, Jesus came and lived on earth like we live on earth. He knew what it was to be tempted. He knew what it was to have people just make you crazy. He, he lived and experienced the, the vast array of things that we do so that our good shepherd has made sure that we don't go someplace where he hasn't already been. Here's something to keep in mind as we, as we look about, uh, talk about um, shepherds, and what the psalmist wrote. The psalmist David here writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice he didn't say, Yea, though I, I stuck in the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say, I'm, I'm going to camp out in the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say, I'm going to die in the valley of the shadow of death. He said, as I go through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, the thing is to get to the higher places, to get to stay close to the sheep, sometimes the sheep have to stay close to the shepherd. Sometimes they have to go through the valleys to get to things that are even better. It's pretty customary to use this verse when we're a, a verse of consolation, if you will, when we're with people who perhaps are in the valley of the shadow of death, people who are, who are on their way, as Pastor Dick would have said, rounding third and headed home. But let me just point out a couple of things about that to you. Typically, when people are actively dying, they don't see darkness. They see light. And second of all, this valley of the shadow of death is not an end. That valley is an entrance to what comes next, to the promise that we have of eternal life. It's actually the beginning when we walk through that valley. There's nothing there to fear because just as the shepherd leads the sheep through these valleys and ravines, so our shepherd is in the valleys with us. There isn't one of us here who hasn't been in a valley of some kind, who won't be in a valley of some kind. Maybe some of us are in that valley right now. But the thing is, whatever has put us there isn't a dead-end street. It's not like we're going to come to the end and things just stop and we go no farther. That valley is the path that we take to get closer to the shepherd. It's the way that we go to find even better things. And if we've been in a valley before and we're still here, then we've learned some things about our good shepherd. We've learned that he does, in fact, go with us, that he won't leave us or forsake us. And the truth be told, until we've walked through a valley of one kind or another, we won't really have discovered that place of refreshment that we often find in the Lord in the middle of whatever's going on in our lives. And not only that, but those of us who have walked through the valley 
whatever it may be, whatever struggle or trouble, we're the ones who are now equipped to help others who are in the same situation that we've been in. So not only do they walk through the valley of the shadow of death with the Lord, but they can walk through that valley with you or with me because we know that Jesus is with us. We can bring that hope and that promise with us. We don't have to be afraid. You see, the question isn't how many valleys have we gone through. The question isn't how dark or dim is this valley. The question is, how do we react when we find ourselves in a valley? What do we do? When the shepherds travel with their sheep, they bring a bare minimum of things with them. It's a lot to carry and to mind these sheep. And so perhaps they have a, a, a knapsack or a, a backpack of, of some kind. Maybe there's a slingshot in that backpack. There's probably something that they can use for first aid for the sheep. And they bring their rod and their staff. The psalmist tells us, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And the rod often becomes an extension of the shepherd's right hand. Oftentimes, they lay it down at night. Otherwise, it's in their hand all the time. And we're not just talking a stick here. Oftentimes, the, a rod is de described as like a cudgel. It's almost like a club. Modern day today, oftentimes shepherds will put nails at the end, in the end of this, of this rod. And they, they use it to beat off predators. They use it to get sheep's attention. They don't beat the sheep with it, but a, a trained shepherd can take that rod and whistle it through the air and get the sheep's attention so that they will turn around and return to where the shepherd is. That rod is a symbol of their power, their strength, their authority. And it's the rod that the shepherd relies on, not only to keep his flock safe, but to keep himself safe. I read a story this week about a, a man in East Africa, and he, he was a shepherd, and he was with a younger shepherd boy, and down in the, in the valley below, there was a herd of elephants, and they were trying to get the elephants to move because there was danger that was coming, and they were decided they were going to shove this rock down the hill, and, and the rock rolling would get the elephants moving. And here's the young shepherd with his rod in his hand. And as they moved the rock, what they found was a cobra that had been coiled under the rock and now it was standing up, head flared out, ready to strike. And that fast, because that shepherd boy had his rod, he was able to kill the snake. They didn't put their rods down. When you think about it, it was Moses' rod that God used to demonstrate to both Pharaoh and to the Israelites the power that God had given him to lead his people. So we don't have rods per se. I, I don't know any pastor or priest who carries a rod around with them. But for us today, the rod becomes the spoken word of God. It's the extended activity of God's mind, of his will for you and me. It's how God deals with his sheep today, with you and with me. Because God's word carries with it convicting power. Power that says, thus saith the Lord. And we see it in what the prophets spoke and what is written. We see it in the words that Jesus has spoken. We see that power and that authority when Peter preaches and when Paul preaches. And frankly, the spoken word of God today and even the, the, the read word of God today has the ability and has, for many of us, hit us right between the eyes and we're convicted of something that we shouldn't be doing. Just as the rod was the extension of the shepherd's hand, so is God's word the extension of his will for you and for me. 
There's, there's an awful lot of noise in the world today. A lot of it is harmful. Some of it's just nonsense, and some of it's just flat-out noise. But if we can tune that out, if we can focus solely on the Word of God, if we hear His voice, then we know who we are. We know whose we are. We know where we're supposed to go and what it is that God would have us do in His name. God's Word brings comfort. It brings conviction, just like the shepherd's rod. But the shepherd also uses his rod to count and to examine the sheep. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 20, you'll read this. The Lord says through Ezekiel, I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. This isn't just the shepherd trying to control the sheep. This is the shepherd would hold his rod out and the sheep would pass underneath it. And he would count them as his. And he could look at them and examine them and make sure that they were okay. And while it might sound invasive and might sound scary, it actually brought comfort to the sheep. Because the shepherd not only would hold the rod out, but he would touch every single one of his sheep, and they're really social animals. This is how the shepherd often found trouble. But listen again to what David says. This is, again, Psalm 139. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Because, you see, if we are willing to open ourselves up, I mean, how many of us try to hide what we do from the Lord? If we are willing, God will, by His Word, search us, just like the shepherd searches the sheep. So here we have David inviting his shepherd to search him, to make sure there's nothing untoward in him, to make sure that he is healthy, and ready to serve. But the shepherd also carries a staff that identifies the shepherd as a shepherd. Shepherds of sheep are the only people who deal with animals who use that staff. It's designed, it's shaped, it's built specifically to use with sheep. So while the rod speaks of, of power and authority, the staff speaks more of, of long-suffering, of patience, of kindness. And while the rod is a symbol of God's Word, the staff is a symbol of the Spirit of God. We are convicted by the Word. But when Christ deals with us, when His Spirit comes upon us, then we, we see this this kindness, this, this gentleness that the Holy Spirit often brings. And so shepherds use their staff for a variety of ways. They, they use the, the crook end to pick up lambs and reunite them with their mothers when they get separated. They use the other end of their staff to, to guide the sheep. They'll literally press the, the bottom half of the staff into the side of a sheep to guide it where they want it to go. And it brings the sheep comfort. It's almost like the shepherd is walking with the sheep hand in hand. It's a picture we see of Jesus with us. He reminds us in John 16 that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all the truth. It's the Spirit who beckons us. It's the Spirit who says, come, follow me. Come, walk with me. Luther tells us that the Spirit is the one who calls, gathers, enlightens, and strengthens. The one who draws us in, draws us closer to the Lord. So that we can say along with David, your staff comforts me. Your spirit is my consolation. 
David wrote, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is one of the flock writing this, David. One who knows that the goal for the shepherd is to find prime food, to find higher ground. In some parts of the world, including here in Arizona, that often means finding a mesa, the Spanish word for table. This is, for me, this is a really cool picture here. So they look for the table lands. These are the places that the shepherds scope out, the places where the grass grows lush and, and thick, the places where they go to prepare for the sheep. The shepherd prepares a table for the sheep. And often when they go on their scouting expeditions before they bring the sheep, they bring salt with them, they bring minerals with them so that the sheep have everything they need at this table that is prepared. Sheep in particular, lambs, want to make, they want to check everything out. They want to experience everything. They want to taste everything, including things that are dangerous to them. So the sheep make, the shepherd makes sure that these places are as safe as they can be. We're no different than the sheep. How many of us want to try everything? We want to experience everything. We want to do all kinds of things, even when we know they aren't safe for us. And so our shepherd has gone before us to watch over us and to protect us from things, including ourselves. Because believe it or not, in these idyllic places, the green pastures, there are predators there too. The shepherd is always on high alert. And you and I, regardless of where we are, are in danger of our predator, of the evil one. Scripture describes him as a roaring lion, as one who crouches at the door waiting for any, any possibility, any opening, no matter how small it is, so that he can come into our lives and wreak havoc. And every time I read that about Satan crouching at the door and, and waiting to come in, I picture a cockroach. There are many today who don't believe that the evil one exists, but all you have to do is go to whatever source you get your news. And we see evil every single day. Like the shepherd and the sheep who try to stay together, we would be well to walk close to our shepherd. Because the thing about sheep is this. Many times when a predator attacks, the sheep just simply go stiff. They freeze. They panic. They don't even make any sound. And before the shepherd knows it, it's too late. But how many of us have found ourselves in trouble so deep that we aren't sure how we can get out? How many of us have been paralyzed by the place that we find ourselves in? How many of us have are, are just like the sheep and we don't make a sound either. We don't ask for help. We're going to figure this out come hell or high water. But that's not what the shepherd wants for us. And so we have his word. We have other believers to walk with us. We have the ability to go to him in prayer. We can be confident in the care that we receive from our good shepherd. That means that our Christian walk can be a tableland experience, a, a mesa experience. It's hard work for these shepherds to, to prepare these tables, this place for the sheep. It takes a lot of work. It was hard work for our shepherd, excruciating for our shepherd, to do what needed to be done to prepare a table for you and for me. The shepherd would go alone. Our shepherd was alone when he prepared the table for us. We see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Emily, if I could have the first picture. 
This is actually the Garden of Gethsemane. That tree in the foreground is somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 years old. There's a really, really good chance that tree was standing in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus prayed there. And he was there with his disciples, and yet he was alone. Half of them were asleep. The other half had no idea what was going on. And Jesus was arrested, and he was taken to the high priest and to Caiaphas. So if I could have the next picture, please. This is a church that was built over the place where the Antonia Fortress is. This is where they would have taken Jesus after he was arrested. There were people everywhere, and Jesus was still alone. He was mocked, and he was beaten, and he was spit on. And then there's the Via Dolorosa. And so first you see the sign on the wall, and then you see the Via Dolorosa. So just to give you some perspective, this is part of the Via Dolorosa. You can see that it's only about a car and a half wide. And oftentimes, if I could have the next one, Emily, it's crammed full of people. And so when you think about it being that narrow, even in the midst of people standing who knows how deep, it makes perfect sense that people could spit on him, that they could throw things at him and hit him. And in the midst of all of these people, he was still alone on the way to prepare a table for you and me. And then if I could have the next. This is in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And there are many who believe that this stone, you see people touching it. There's a woman in the foreground kissing it. There are, are many that believe that this is the spot where Jesus was crucified. But they also believe that there could be another place. And so if we go to the next picture, this at the time would have been outside the city. This is called Skull Rock. You can see kind of two eyes in, in decades and centuries past. You could see eyes and mouth. This is a stone's throw from the garden tomb. So if I could have the next one. This is the entrance to what most everyone believes is the garden tomb. And then the next slide. And this is most likely the place where Jesus' body lay. When we come to this table to eat the bread and drink the wine, it is well for us to remember how much this meal cost. Jesus came. He told us that he came so that we would have life, so that we would have it abundantly now, that we would have eternal life when this life is done. And like the shepherd wants to look out over his flock and see them in the lush green pastures, flourishing, Jesus wants to look at you and he wants to look at me and see us flourishing in his tender loving care as well. Last week I talked a little bit about, about oil and how the shepherd would put oil mixed with spices on the heads of the sheep to keep the pests and the bugs away. And I reminded us that, that oil in Scripture is a picture of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In David's day, it was the, the priests and the kings whose heads were anointed with oil. They would literally pour it on the top of their head and it would run down their face and their beard and, and drip on their clothes. The recipe for that oil used only for them is in Exodus 30. We receive the Spirit every day as we read, as we study. And that anointing that we get from the Spirit every day produces traits in us that glorify God. Maybe you've heard of some of them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, those over and against what the world might want to give us. Sheep like to rub heads with each other. It's part of their being social animals. But if they have diseases, that's how they get transmitted in the flock. It's not all that different for us, not that we literally physically rub heads, but how many of us have put our heads together with people who don't think the way that Christ would have us think. 
who don't have the mind of Christ. And so we, we interact with these people and we find ourselves in a not so good place. Because what the world wants for us is really always opposed to what Scripture has to say. The thing is, as children of God, as sheep of the Good Shepherd, we really, truly, should be known as the most contented, peaceful people on earth. You and I, as sheep of the Good Shepherd's flock, should be quiet and restful and content because of who our shepherd is. In every single life, there's a cup, a cup of trouble, a cup of suffering, a cup of something. Jesus' cup was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the cup of God's wrath that he drank so we don't have to. And had it not been that not only did he drink the cup, but that his cup overflowed with his lifeblood poured out, we would be lost. We would be lost completely. We would perish. But instead, what he has given us overflows in our lives as well. Our cup overflows the mercy and the grace and the love that he gives us. And it overflows and it spills out on those that we encounter often bringing blessing to those people. Sheep who have a good shepherd are content. They don't want to go any place else. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. They're great words. They're easy to say. Right? But... What if we're with somebody that we love dearly and they're suffering or dying? Can we still boast about goodness and mercy? What if, what if the job goes away? There's no prospects. There's no money to pay the bills to buy the medicine. Can we still proclaim God's goodness and mercy? When friends or family turn against us, can we still claim goodness and mercy all the days of our lives when in reality we might just want to turn tail and run? When we look at this psalm, everything we see in all six verses of this psalm are born out of love. Everything the shepherd does for his sheep comes from love, the care, the tending, the work, the watchfulness, the, 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 the self-sacrifice, all of that is born for the sheep because the shepherd loves. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And John reminds us of that when we get to 1 John 3. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's what the shepherd does. So as I thought about goodness and mercy being what Jesus has left for us, I wondered, what do we leave for others? What is our legacy going to be? The sheep, if properly cared for, are some of the most beneficial animals in the world. They will eat all kinds of things, including weeds. And oftentimes when sheep are moved from one pasture to the next, the pasture is weed-free and very well fertilized. What do we leave? What is our legacy? Sadness or gladness? Peace or turmoil? Do we leave forgiveness or do we leave bitterness? Are we going to leave contentment? or conflict. When people think of us, will they remember joy or frustration, love or rancor? What is our attitude towards others? Are we willing to treat people the way that Jesus has treated us? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I go there to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. But here in the psalm, that forever house has a different feeling. It has a different connotation. Yes, we anticipate, anticipate a place that is prepared for us. But here, the thought of a, a forever house, a home, is more about the family. It's more about the flock staying together. It's about the sheep being so satisfied that they don't want to go anywhere else. It's about the sheep wanting to be in the presence of the shepherd. There's one way into the sheepfold. It's through the shepherd. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. He's called himself the gate. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so what, what we end up with here is sheep saying that not only is the shepherd ever present, but that they want to be in full view of the shepherd at all times. So you and I can say with David, the Lord is my shepherd and I will dwell in his presence forever. Well, Lord God, the promises are staggering that you have gone to prepare a place for us. For us, look at us, Lord. We are like sheep. We try to go our own ways, do our own thing, because we're sure we know better. And you're patient and you're kind, slow to anger, abounding with steadfast love. You love us, Lord. You tend to us, you watch over us, you guide us, your word convicts us and comforts us. Your spirit calls us to you to gather with other believers. We come nowhere close to deserving that, Lord. And yet you've prepared a table for us. You have a meal for us, a meal that reminds us how much you love us. So God, we have two words that seem really small and really inadequate. But thank you is what we have. Thank you for who you are and what you have done and for what you continue to do and for what you will do. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen.